topic that I was told that we'll be discussing is how can women drive change. Before I tell you the many stories that I intend to tell you, I'd like you to start imagining. The way you imagine, like the way you can say, imagine you're in America, imagine you're in Europe, imagine you're in a Hague. So I want you to imagine like it's on a Friday evening. Kwanza, I know most of you are in uni, and don't even lie, most of you go for parties. So you go for parties. Imagine you're in that club, in UST, there in some corner, and then it's lit, your crowd is coming, people are having drinks, and then you, so you're still imagining now. You're not, you imagine, you're in, you're in UST, we are not in part 254, we're in UST. So, um, there is a party, there are people who are having drinks, entertaining each other. There's this guy who is fighting with the chick, uh, with, a, with a, another guy because of this chick or whatever. And suddenly people are leaving, people are getting excited and now they have decided to club hope from UST to uh, Hallingham or whatever. See, see, when you're imagining that kind of an event, you're imagining now there are people who are like dancing, there are others who are doing their party party and everything. In your imagination, when you're imagining those people who are in UST, who are in going to Kilimani and everywhere, those people you're imagining, if you're being honest with me, did you think one of those people is a person who is disabled like me in that party in UST? Did you think... Like they could just be disabled, but they're going for hangi and taking alcohol and taking vodka and enjoying. Did you think of that? Uh, but you thought probably it's your friend or your peer dancing and everything. Um, I wanted to start at that point because the we imagine things that are familiar to us. You imagine you imagined going to West because you have actually gone, and if you've not gone, you are planning to go. But the fact that we didn't imagine that there are disabled people in UST having a good time, your peers in uni, one is that probably in your uni environment, you don't have many disabled students. And if they're there, they probably don't come to UST with you. I start from that point because I consider myself young. I consider myself your average urban young woman. But I still feel very invisible. And you agree with me that disabled people like me are very invisible in your average normal life. So the day the disability story will come, it's on the International Women's International Disability Day, and then the journalist, you know the way they usually go to some village in Okwe to Moranga, and then they, they go, they get those, have you ever seen that ka family that is so poor, and then they have two, two disabled kids, and then story na kwanga too, against all odds, and then they start. This is, they are suffering, and then now people will feel mercy, they'll set up a bill number, and then the story will come. I have a problem with the way our society is setting narratives around disabled people like me. Because while I could consider myself disadvantaged and having a disability and having probably a health issue, there are still other facets of my life. For example, I love to blog. I have a blog called Hummingbird. I love to go for entertainment. In fact, I know many, many entertainment joints more than most of us here. I love to travel. I love to make money. I love to do other things. But the very narrative that we have in Kenya in 2019, unfortunately, is that disabled people are sad. They are supposed to just be there. They are supposed to, to, to be helped a bit. They are supposed to come at that story in the newspaper of against all odds. And then they will be projected as people who have struggled too much. They are now at the mercy of society. Let's do something for these people. Um, if you look at statistics, according to World Health, Health Organization, 10% of people in the world have a disability. That means for every 10 of us, one person has a disability. It could be like different forms of disability. But when it comes to our normal day-to-day -day life, people with disabilities are never reflected in normal activities of society. We are looking at social activities like the club I've told you about. We are looking at economic activities like doing business, give, getting grants for, from government. Let's not even go to political processes because they are there. To, actually, they are not even seen, live alone, being heard. I was born many years ago. Actually, I got 28 not so long time ago. I was born in a family of six. We are six of us. I'm the second born. Um, and then my mother and then my father, they are there. And I became disabled because of medical negligence. You know the way doctors, quacks, your child is sick and then they touch something that should not be touched. And then I remember when I was five. And like I can't tell you the story before I was five, but after five, then I can remember things that increasingly now I come to see them as 
discrimination and how at a young age you, you, you just have to start worrying and making sure you are just the best. So I was taken to a boarding school when I was six years old. And my mother argued, you know, now here in these village schools, those kids are pushing you too much. Because I used to just get pushed. Okay, I went to the village school where the kids in primary took away. You know those village schools where they put a khaki short? And then there's always a standard yellow, yellow blouse. Like, I don't know where they got that uniform, but in every village there's that uniform. So for us, we had that kind of thing. So I used to just get, you know, you are pushed. So I used to wear a kamak or whatever they am running. So I was taken to a boarding school. When I was in the boarding school, that's when I started to realize it was a special school, actually. By the way, I'm different. Like, why is it that I'm seven, six years old, I'm in a boarding school, like I'm in class one in a boarding school, and then you are, you are missing home. The, sometimes you even forget. Like I remember there's a time I forgot the Karusu at home. Because we've been in school for three, three months. You don't even. So I, I, I was wondering, is it this route or this other route? Anyway, I'll get into the politics of, of education. Then I finished my primary school education. And then I started asking myself, if I have a disability and then I'm going to finish school and then go to live in society, why should I be in a special school? So when I went to my high school, I did not want to be in a special school because I felt, why should I just be living secluded and alone and, and stuff like that? So I went to a typical normal high school. Um, one day, I remember, I should have been in Form 3. It's one of those days when in Form 3, the body is starting to change. You are getting fat and you know the way you, you used to be in, like in high school. So one day I was from the washroom. I had gotten late because, you know, the way the bell rings and everyone flies, like us, we were told that movement is by running, not by walking. So there was always girls flying, like, someone is from here. So I was just go coming from there. So we met with my deputy principal, though she died, like, last year. And then she, she asked me, why are you outside and the break time is over? I told her, I was from the washroom. She told me, you see, you have a problem with walking. You have to always wake up earlier than everybody else and make sure you are doing your things faster. So it got to me that even in high school, well, I just want to be normal, eat my sugar the way we used to eat sugar and move, move around, not worry too much, fail in chemistry, pass in English. <laughs> that you just have to now, you, I, was got, I got to this point where you are supposed to prove yourself and be extra so that you can make it. So me, I said, if this is how we are living, me, I'll be waking up earlier. So when people are waking up at 4, I'd wake up at 3.45 so that I can shower faster, faster, nini, nini. And then now from there, I'll start. Anyway, I finished my high school, and I was privileged to go to USIU for my first degree and then do my my other degree at University of Nairobi. But then, OK, yeah, you can clap if you want. <laughs> but, <laughs> but why am I stuck in that story? The story of my deputy principal telling me that you have to wake up a bit earlier and, and do thing a bit extra, that phrase, has, I have really lived with it. Because even in uni, even in the workplace, like you're going to work or you're trying to perform, it's like when you're, you have a disability, you sort of have to prove yourself a bit extra. Like you don't have the privilege of people saying, ah, you're, you're welcome, we have faith in you. You have to work so hard and be a bit extra so that people can say, by the way, let's give her a chance, let's give her. And there's something that that does to your, to your soul. You have to always feel like you have to prove yourself. Yet, what me I want is just to go to work, do my things, go back home, watch a movie, and sleep. But the moment you have to prove yourself, it means you have to work extremely hard. You probably have to work overtime. You have to constantly keep, keep uh, constant, constantly prove yourself. I don't think there's anyone in society who want to feel like they have to always justify their legitimacy in a space. They have to justify their place in the, you know, being at, and I've had very many stories of, and I, I'd want to consider myself one of the t only 2% disabled people women who have actually got an opportunity to go to school. According to the statistics from UNDP, only 2% of disabled women have, have literacy level. So it means just because I was lucky and just because my parents were progressive and just because I got opportunities, 98% of girls like me, who have a brain like me, who have everything like me, never went to school. And it's not because they cannot be able to study. It's just because their parents, like everybody else, had these prejudices. No, this one, even if we take her to school, no, no one will employ her. No, this one, I invest in her, and yet she won't even get someone to marry. Now this one, now this one. The moment 
we continue living part of the education system. The moment we continue leaving women with disabilities, young women, young girls, out of spaces where things are happening, where we are socializing. I think even in peer groups, in schools and everything, that's where people learn other social skills. That's where, I, even most of you can agree with me, you learned about contraception in your peer groups there in uni, in the halls where you had, hey, you know, there's P2 and everything. So the moment these disabled girls are out of places where people socialize, where people learn, then it means at any given time they are not, not social smart, they are not able to know how to navigate the streets, and so on and so forth. So that is my story to the extent that it's a personal experience but it's a lived experience and it's just, it's out there. Haven't you ever seen how, for instance, there was um, a story in the media about um, a Matatu driver who used to feel massive for disabled employees somewhere in Westland and he'd go out of his way to pick them? But my question is, yes, he's doing an act, an, an act of kindness and of course he'll train and will feel nice for him. But how better would it be if public transport is accessible so that if I want to go wherever I want to go, I don't have to think about the ex extra cost of getting a taxi to where I want to go. How easy would it be that even if I want to go to Nairobi town and do my things, I don't want to have to worry about accessibility. And maybe not only me, but people who have more mobility challenges, people who have more challenges to do with accessibility and so on, um, and, so on and so forth. But I got inspired, I got inspired the moment I started interacting, the moment I started going to communities, the moment I started interacting with disabled people, I thought, you know, I used to think that, you know, I'm different, maybe I'm not even lucky, but I started thinking, by the way, I'm so privileged. Even the fact that you've gone to school, even though you are failing, even though too you've just had something like this, you are way a step ahead. So around that time, around 2010, that's how I sort of started going to these NGO spaces. You know, when you're in uni, and then you see a cabana saying, you're welcome, Transport will be reimbursed, and then there will be refreshments. You know how it's a motivator. <laughs> so, me I started getting motivated. So I'd go to these spaces for women, these two spaces for, for youth and everybody. But there's something that was born in me, and I thank God because I didn't have classes on Thursdays when I was in, like first first year and second year in uni. Because that's when I used to go to these women meetings. There was a particular non-government organization that used to have meetings of women, and that for me rekindled. Something uh, like there was something that was born in my heart that if you're a woman and you have a voice, however small, the fact that you're in the room, there's something you can contribute. Around that time when Wangari Madai died, I sort of started just googling and reading about her, and I was really inspired by her story about the hummingbird, and that's why my blog is called The Hummingbird. And Wangari Madai says, when it comes to a hummingbird, it was a small bird in the forest, then there was a fire, and then all the big animals were saying, me, me, I can't do anything. Hey, the elephant were like, hey, me, I'm too big. But the hummingbird said, let me do something, however small, and it might change something. So that's how I got into this politics of getting women with disabilities together, getting young girls. And some of these the acts are very small. It's not even the big acts. It's about telling someone, let's come and, come and meet, let's meet in town. Because these people have never even, it's not like they can't afford, but they have never even gotten the courage to go to public, like to some coffee place and just hang out and, and do things. Um, my blog, I feel like it sort of humanized disabled people because traditionally we are very objectified. Like sometimes, and as part of my doing my small thing and how I feel I'm driving change as a person, um, it's because, let's look, for instance, a young woman and her story is given in the news. We always focus on the struggle, but let's also look at people and, and say, she's not only this one thing. And I've had that experience. Even when I remember one, one of the days I was somewhere and I was waiting for a doctor. This guy comes, me, I'm sitting here chilling, nini. The guy will come, even before he asks his name, even before he asks your name, even be, before he asks where you live or what you do, they'll be, hey, so what happened to you? It's an accident, is it permanent, is it not? Uh, let, let me not even start about the story of dating. That is a story for another day. <laughs> but um, that's really how it has been uh, for me and for, and for others. Currently, I'm working as a gender officer in a particular government institution. But my takeaway home is women who are driving change in Kenya. I think the fact that women know the cost, you know, the women are the ones who give birth. And women, they, it's women who give birth to some of, even some of us anyway, we are, we are children of women. I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even me, yeah. But what else, yeah. So I, I feel like when we have more women in leadership, when we have more women in political spaces, I feel like even life, 
some of our lives will be better because women they might there might be a few nasty ones but your average woman this is something they feel about their children you're, when you go to a woman you tell them now you know me i'm suffering like this like that they'll always have that burden because by nature or by whatever they are born to be nurturing and uh, they try as much as possible to do things so um, disability in itself has a unique perspective when it interacts with gender and especially being a woman like i remember during the political processes i was trying to be um, very very active so i remember when i used to go to those spaces for politics some people would say yo wanja you know there are those spaces for disabled people so when you know women's space it's like yes you are there but not not there like you're somewhere in between it's like you are gray when everyone is black or white then i used to go to the youth places and they were saying so unajua katiba imesema tu so I then get pushed to the disability space you're forgetting those disabled men they are also part of the patriarchy so in the end you feel so lost you don't know where you should be up or down or what what and i i think those are things we need to incorporate and if i look at this subject in, in our current situation in the world the big topic in the world is the sustainable development goals and then we are trying in kenya to do the big to vision 2030 we are trying the big four agenda the big four agenda i know maybe people have different opinions about it but and uh, i've always told people whenever you are doing some of these initiatives think of the least first what are my concerns in the big four agenda when you talk about universal healthcare i have added cost when it comes to healthcare when you talk about manufacturing let's not even start talking about the how unemployed how unemployed and how unemployed disabled youths are when you talk about food security probably special dietary plan not even mentioning the accessibility of of of, uh, of agriculture moving into the future and if i feel that kenya will really embrace the fruits and the gains of the constitution 2010 because some of us are even in this space because the people who fought and even though we are having the two that gender rule which is the women issue i feel like if we really want to say that kenya is moving forward kenya Ke kenya should be a reflection of our diversity i have I have a problem particularly with the media and how it depicts us of course the issues of advertising the moment a gov the government is saying that they want to support this particular number of women they should say that those women should reflect the diversity of of, of women uh, across the country um and I feel even those of us in this room we have a role to play and our role will be to start these conversations because i feel like it's so misleading to assume that people are okay people are standard people, even anyway even the fingers of our hands are not equal so and they are not they are not the same and um if we do that i feel like we will tap into the potential of 10% of the world's population and you know, me i usually say like even where i work I usually say in fact i'm a good employee i don't know what my boss thinks because i have not seen a salary increment but i still think i'm a good employee and you know why it's because like when i get to the office like this i've already known the amount of what i've taken i've already paid so the chance that i leave that office to go to roam in town they are very minimal because i'm not even flexible like i know how i'll walk like today i know how i'll walk and where i'll go like i know where i'll go but why can't they tap into my inability to move move around to make sure that i'm productive in the workplace and i people can easily contribute and in any case uh, research has proven that people with disabilities are able to be productive and their productivity as at work is not in any way affected by affected by disability and if we look at and i usually say disability is part of our society it doesn't have to be a unique issue where i say now we we disabled people are sitting in this corner i have a feeling that should be reflected in employment in advertising let's start with advertising by the way i've never seen i'm a consumer i have the ability to purchase but i've never seen an advertisement that honestly reflects disabled who are actually consumers and yet we know like there is this advert that is moving around the internet a lot about this guy in red eating a uh, this chicken red and this guy who is eating a burger of the in green you know which telecom uh, companies are fighting but my issue is if those adverts are the ones that are having all this buzz online then it means that advertisement media storytelling um have a way of changing perceptions about people and if people are projected as human people who can contribute um life in my opinion will be better for for some of us um and as i try to conclude and say that there is a huge intersectionality between disability being young and being a woman i feel like um moving into the future 
institutions need and of course education plays a big role media plays uh, a big role our online spaces and we are in the online spaces um we have to continue changing the narrative we have to continue questioning the norm um and it is it, it has been there it's so much on our face like th this is the way these people should be this is the way these other people should be uh, if we do that, if we incorporate all those kind of thinking that our society is diverse, disability just happens to be one of those things, then we'll be able to tap into the strengths, into the abilities of people. And my parting shot should be, let's try and embrace inclusivity because disabled people are part of our family members. They are our cousins, they are our parents, they are our, let's include people so that they can enjoy being Kenyans some some people and uh, some disabled people i think they don't even feel like they're kenyan because the other time there was a bursary program and a friend of mine who has a disability called me and asked should i apply then i was like see the qualification is being a kenyan citizen being of this age nini and then she was like you know i just wanted to know if disabled people are supposed to apply then i was like but you are kenyan but the more people feel so excluded they don't even feel like they deserve to enjoy the goodies that come with being kenyan um the long and the short of it is that all of us can be hummingbirds, just like my, my blog. You can do a small, small contribution and it will have a ripple effect. You can stand for some disabled person who is being harassed somewhere in the streets. You can ask why, for example, the, your favorite alcohol joint is not accessible. You can ask why in your institutions of higher learning there's no accessibility. And if you do your small things and if I do my small thing, we shall be moving pebbles around the hill and at some point in the future we shall slay the mountain. Thank you very much.